It's time to accelerate. Hey, friends, this is Andy. Welcome to 2020. This is the first episode of the new year, the new decade, as a matter of fact. So today is episode 742 of Accelerate, the sales podcast of record. So another excellent episode lined up for you today. I said the first of this year, the first of this decade. And it's only appropriate then that my guest is Sherry Levitin. Sherry is the author of a best-selling book titled Heart and Cell, 10 Universal Truths Every Salesperson Needs to Know. And we're going to be diving into these universal truths for salespeople. Now, Sherry used her sales consulting experiences to write a, a sales book that's really more of a life book. And I think that's so important to talk about in sales because we're going to talk today about why who you are matters more necessarily than what you do. And this has been a theme I've been writing about and I really like the way Sherry talks about in her book. And we're going to get into the difference between uh, what she points out as resume values and eulogy values. I think it's first brought up by David Brooks in his book on character. And uh, eulogy, eulogy virtues are what make the difference in today's digital environment. Think about, you know, you have a list of things that you're supposedly good of that you list on your resume. But what is it that people would say about you at the end of your life? And those are the things that we want to communicate with our buyers. So we're going to dive into why, also why it's necessary for a company to not only reward quota achievement, but also to put an equal emphasis on rewarding personal growth, personal individual growth. Uh, Sherry gives an example. She shares how her company provides a budget for everyone in the company that they can spend on their own personal development. And I think that's so important for sales because we put increasing uh, targets on our salespeople, but then we don't measure whether we've <laughs> invested or they've invested appropriately to grow in order to hit those increased targets. So uh, we're then going to take a spin through Sherry's 10 universal sales truths. And I have to admit, we don't get through all of them. That's okay because you're going to need to make sure you purchase her book and read it to get to all 10. And as I said before, I recommend you do that. So we get into all that and much, much more. But before we get to Sherry, I want to take a minute to talk to you about VanillaSoft. VanillaSoft is the industry's leading sales engagement platform, but most people simply refer to it as the solution. It's the solution to ensure sales development reps make the right number of attempts for every lead. It's the solution to ensure sales development reps use more than just email, that they consistently use LinkedIn and even the dreaded telephone as part of their sales playbook. It's the solution to serve the sales development rep the next best lead over and over again so that they hit their numbers. The solution starts with the right sales cadence, and that's why you need to check out VanillaSoft's guide on sales cadences. It's titled, Sales Cadences, What Works, What Doesn't, and Why You're Frustrated. You can get your copy now, your free copy, at VanillaSoft.com forward slash Andy Paul. That is VanillaSoft.com forward slash Andy Paul. All right, let's jump into it. Sherry, welcome to Accelerate. Thank you, Andy. Glad to be here. Well, it's a pleasure to finally have you on the show. I can't believe we didn't make it happen before. I know, we, but we only met I know, a few months ago. Which is surprising to me. But I had heard of you. Your, your reputation like, precedes you. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> is that a good thing or a bad thing? <laughs> oh, no. You were billed as the smartest man in sales. Really? Yeah. You have to tell me who By told Jill Conrad. Jill oh, Conrad. My, oh, my gosh. Yeah. I'll have to... <laughs> I have to get her to put that on paper. <laughs> she did say the smartest man, though. Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> so. <laughs> I'll, I'll take that, though. She's no fool. <laughs> She's no fool. You know, it's funny. I met Jill because I'm a relative latecomer to this game of you know writing books about sales and all that stuff. And I remember the first time she and I had a sort of an extended conversation. And, and I told her, I said, you know, we're designing a new website. And I told the designer, Look at what Jill does and just copy that. <laughs> just do what Jill does. So um, where are you joining us from today? I'm in Park City, Utah, where it's going to hit 12 degrees by the end of the day. Wow. But it is gorgeous. It's sunny. It's beautiful. And we're getting snow, so we'll have great skiing uh, probably within a week or two. I was going to ask that. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So slopes aren't quite open yet. No, but soon, and uh, we're praying for a good snow year. Perfect. Wow. So I have good friends that are planning on retiring to Park City. So uh, it's a nice place. It is. Yeah. We love it here. All right. Well, we're going to talk about your book, 
Heart and Sell, 10 Universal Truths Every Salesperson Needs to Know. So I guess the first question is, what was the impetus to write the book? I had wanted to write a book for years and years. I started my company in 97. And, you know, we we grew, we and mostly on a live training model. So mm-hmm. corporations would hire us and it was very expensive to have us come in. You know, we, either I would come in or one of our trainers would come in and then we had lots of products. I mean, this is back in the day where we had audio tapes and videotapes. And, <laughs> and then of course we moved to online learning. But for so many years, there were two factors, Andy. One was that I didn't have a product that I thought could help the individual seller without them having their company you know, bring me right. in to do something live that was very grand in scale. So you know, we were getting requests from as far as India and Africa, and there was no way we could um, you know, serve all those people. So having a $12 product mm-hmm. <laughs> was huge for us. Um, and I did have an epiphany later in life. Uh, I became an accidental parent mm-hmm. uh, six, seven years ago. I told you that story. And I realized actually through parenting that the soft skills, if you will, empathy, curiosity, um, they're not something you do. You know, I had been teaching sellers for years, you know, here's the three-step method too. Here's the four things Mm -hmm. you need to learn in Mm -hmm. discovery. And the epiphany I had, I always wondered, how come sellers in the same environment, how come some of them will make $300,000 and the other will make 30? How come some of them, you know, are retiring and and others are struggling to pay their rent, yet they're using the same system. They're using the same methodology, if you will. They're selling the same product. And I had this huge epiphany being a parent that what you do, to to use, quote, Brene Brown, what you do matters, Mm -hmm. but who you are matters more. Right. And so these soft skills had been missing in my training for years. The, The skills underneath the skills. So the 10 universal truths, the way it's separated is there's, five truths on what you need to do to be successful, Mm -hmm. not only in sales and in life. And I think that's what's critical to me in writing this book. It it was more of a life book. And and if you follow these truths, you'll not only have a better life, oh, you'll sell a whole lot more by the way. But so it's five what to do's and then five who to be's. Mm -hmm. And so the combination of the two. Well, I think it's such a critical point to bring out because I for one thing, I think in general, when you look at sales hiring, that managers in general, this is my experience based on work with hundreds of companies and probably thousands of managers, is that they put very little emphasis on values and character and in terms of assessing and evaluating people formally. Right? They might say, oh, this you know, person seems like a very nice, polite person, but I – I don't see them asking questions that really sort of try to plumb whether that person actually has the values and character that enable them to be the best version of themselves. Yeah, there's no question. Um, I, I quote David Brooks in my book, uh, mm-hmm. his book on, on character, character. Yep. Which, I've, which I've read. Yeah. And I love his distinction. He says there's two types of virtues. In life, right? There's the resume virtues, and that is our experience, what we've done, uh, what we've accomplished, how how we've crushed quota, so to speak. Those are your resume virtues. He says, but then there's the eulogy virtues, Mm -hmm. what they'll say about you once you're gone. And really, those eulogy virtues, things like kindness, integrity, curiosity, you talk about that a lot. It's the eulogy virtues that really make the difference in today's environment where, you know, we're digitizing everything, mm-hmm. right? We, we, we're going to, we need to do today everything Alexa can't do in order to survive in sales. Well, yeah. Well, I think that to a point, to maybe amplify a point you just made is, is I think that, that these have always been important virtues, but I think, I think they're becoming more important, right? I think as, as we see more automation technology come into the sales space, AI, it was just, interviewing someone right before you about AI and sales, is that, yeah, we can have a point where there's more sort of guided selling done, you know, <laughs> automatically. But that experience for a buyer 
is you know whether they're dealing with one person's automated sales system or another person's you know sales machine pretty undifferentiated and so exactly. at the end of the day people still want some expertise they want some insights they want some validation they want something from another human being which research has already shown this in the case of they've done pretty extensive research into medical decision making and and yeah, you know, there are algorithms today that could probably, I think they judge that over a period of time, probably give better advice than talking to a doctor statistically in terms of outcomes. But people still feel more comfortable having that human uh, intercession and, and judgment applied to things. Well, and, you know, you want to go to your doctor and have her say, you know, <laughs> let's ask the machine doing in school. You know, yeah. how's Tyler doing on swim team? Right. Right? These, you know, the machine's not going to do that for us. Well, not in authentic fashion, right? I mean, you no. can certainly see we, where we you, could program them, couldn't we? Well, the machines could learn to ask that, right? So, I mean, through yeah. machine learning and AIs, yeah, they could learn that, hey, this is an important piece of data to ask. But, but, but Andy, we couldn't smell them. So, you know about oxytocin. You know, we, sure. there's an oxytocin release when you and I are together. You and I met at the uh, Gartner conference mm-hmm. for the first time. And we obviously trusted each other. You mm-hmm. wouldn't have asked me to be on your podcast. And we must have been releasing this oxytocin, the trust hormone. And even by phone, by Zoom right now, we, there, there's actually a smell, you know this, that enhances trust. And it's that same hormone that women uh, release when they give birth to a child. It helps them to bond. It helps them to have trust. And it helps them to spend money. <laughs> well, there we go. There we go. <laughs> right. So, uh, huh, I don't have a sense of smell, so that'd be interesting. Do I trust people more or less? Interesting. So you yeah. can't smell, or it's not. You no, don't have a very almost nothing. Huh. Just happened about ten years ago. Okay. Yeah. Well, those joys of uh, joys of life. So yeah, just a sudden sudden thing. Anyway, that could come in handy at times, though. Well, I call it my superpower living in New York <laughs> during the summer. Uh, if people spend any time in Manhattan during the summer, sometimes you can come across smells that I remember as being, you know, you hear comedians joke about it. But yeah, no, I'm impervious to those now. So like I said it's my big city superpower. Um, so let's dive into some of your, your universal truths. First of all, I enjoyed the book and I, I recommend it to people listening to the show. Uh, you've got a sly sense of humor that I really appreciate, um, in there and, and, uh, especially liked your Nelson Mandela story with your, your husband. So, the short uh, stop. yeah, the short stop yeah, <laughs> for the Yankees. Yeah. Um, oh, I'm sorry. It was the Mets. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, um, you talk about is the 10 truths are about using proven sales skills without losing your authenticity. So, two words we see a lot in sales is proven and authenticity. So, just want to sort of dive into that as is, is, and I tell you the reason afterwards with proven, but so, what do you say when, I mean, how do you say something's proven? That is a great question, you know, because we all go to research shows, 98% of the people, (laughs) and, you know, we all love statistics today, right? You see all the sales influencers use these statistics, and of course, we all know you can make statistics say anything that you want them to say. Well, especially given in sales. Yeah. They're pretty loose anyway. I mean, so. 78% of customers still say they want a trusted advisor, <laughs> um, which I actually do believe. So, what. Yeah, the, I'd say 100% do. But anyway, yeah, go ahead. Here, here's <laughs> what I think I think you take the statistic. First of all, you need to look at where the proven and where the research comes from. And if it doesn't pass the good sense test, throw it out. So, the way I look at proven is okay, I'm going to look at the source. And I'm going to say, okay, is this Harvard Business Review? Is this, you know, a neuroscientist I know of? But then I'm going to put it through the filter of the good common sense test and say, is that my experience? Is that the experience of others? And I think it's a combination of both. And that's where you get the combination of the 
proven and the authenticity. Does this feel right to me? And I think too many people believe whatever they see on social media or whatever research and just doesn't pass that common sense test. Well, I, I agree. And that's, I, I'm glad you gave that answer because I, <laughs> I agree with that hundred percent. So I think that, that, yeah, one of the problems in sales is we don't have any good research about sales, basically. I mean, Gallup has been doing research and collecting data for a long time, maybe the most authoritative source. But most of what we see that and we read that passes for our science is really statistics. And it's not really science. And even the science that we have, people done studies, yeah, you know, we tend to um, generalize and say, okay, well, you know, somebody does studies saying if you do this, this will influence people to do something. But when you look at the study, it's like, well, yeah, it worked. It was a relatively small sample. It worked 55% of the time. Um, and that's okay if it worked 55% of the time. I think for people, to your point precisely, is they have to look at things and say, is this something that looks true for me? Right? I mean, if, if one person... It, exactly. If one person has done it, if, if it, these things have worked for you, Sherry, that's good for me. I mean, if I trust you, to your point, then, yeah, it doesn't mean they'll work the same way for me, but at least, you know, I can say, okay, there's some some validity to it. And I, I sort of always cringe when I think, hear, or read people sort of reverting to sort of, yeah, let's cherry pick statistics from here and there to <laughs> uh, substantiate something I'm saying when they really don't have any value in that. So I think a lesson just for people people listening is, is to Sherry's point, is, yeah, what resonates with you as true? And then... Yeah, learn a little bit about the person, but then try it, too. And if you try it, I think what's important, I was thinking about this just yesterday, try one thing at a time. We're working with a company, we're consulting with them, and you know they just brought us in, they had a big trigger event, and, and when a CEO or a business owner or a VP of sales, you know, when things aren't going right, it's Q4, you're not hitting quota, that doesn't mean you try four new things at once. No. <laughs> because then you never know what thing... Yeah, <laughs> made the business impact and got you the results. And I think people panic. They press the panic button and they they don't introduce one thing into their sales process or into their marketing or whatever the case may be. Yeah. Well, I, I was, again, I've had that conversation so recently is that I was reading a paper MIT scientist put out well, late 80s, early 90s. A simple formula for change, right? And change management. Introduce one new factor, <laughs> you know, try it, test it until you're sure you've got it. Introduce a second new factor, right? right. Seems, I guess that is marketing 101, uh, isn't it? <laughs> well, not necessarily, no. But it's from a change management standpoint. And you think about it, if you're in sales and you're wondering, okay, yeah, things just aren't clicking, which right. you know, can happen when you're new, can happen when you've been in business for a long time. I mean, sometimes we lose the recipe, we lose our way, is, yeah, trying five new things, all at once, never a recipe for success. Um, so yeah, I was going to say it to the so the in, the converse to what we we're saying about universal truth or things that are proven mm -hmm. is there are universally proven bad behaviors though, and it seems like sometimes I feel like we've sort of lost sight of some of that, um, and yeah, you know, it just seems like. I don't know what the answer is, but we seem to keep having to reteach these generation after generation after generation of sellers. Um, and we don't seem to be getting any better at eradicating them. I mean, to one of your points in the book, one of your truths is, yeah, talk, 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 not listen, not ask questions. Uh, Anything that can be told can be asked. Yeah. I have a similar thing in one book, I call it ask, don't tell. Um, but yeah, similar concept, right? Is if you're in a presentation, at least the way I present it is in your presentation, I mean, I learned this from a boss early in my career, is yeah, anything time you want to ask somebody or tell something, you can phrase it as a question in a way that forces the customer to think. No, it's, it's much less combative and you get information. And, you know, particularly today, you know, in the old days, it was just consultative selling, right? We wanted to find a problem. We wanted to find the implications of that problem. But mm -hmm. today, we have to help people learn how to buy. 
So we have to ask them questions Mm -hmm. so that they think, okay, what is my criteria to buy? What is my decision-making process? I think what Gartner just came out with now, 10 decision-makers. So it's gotten so much more complex today in, in B2B sales. So yes, those, those questions are key and really thinking them through in advance and knowing what you're trying to achieve. So not just willy nilly asking a bunch of questions, but saying, what, why am I asking these questions? What information am I trying to get? And more importantly, what aha do I want my customer to get? So I hear, that's going to be more impactful. So here's sort of a, a digression, a question for you. And, and it's sort of triggered by what you're saying about Gartner. And I've, yeah, you and I are part of this group with Gartner. We get insight to their research before they release it. And, you know, big believer in sort of their, their buying process, their buyer enablement study with the spaghetti diagram of the buying process and, you know, the very opposite of a linear sales process that every company has. Um, so a couple questions. One is, <laughs> There's a lot of companies that most companies have not altered their sales process in response to that that research, right? So here's a company that's done pretty much the most authoritative research on at least enterprise buying behaviors, but I think that extrapolates into even smaller companies as well. And yet, you haven't come across one company that says, huh, how do we change our sales process to reflect this reality of how people are actually buying? Have you seen anybody that has? You know, I feel like I go in regardless of the company, uh, B2B or B2C. We, we do work in B2C as well. Mm-hmm. And, and it's the same what I call default tendencies, right? And I think you have to ask yourself, well, why don't they change? You know, and is it any different than our buyers, right? If the customers are unwilling to change and then we scratch our heads and say, why can't we get our, if the companies aren't willing to change their behavior, I always say what happens in the training process will be duplicated by your sellers in the sales process. Mm -hmm. So, um, no, I I tend to see the, the same challenges, the same default behaviors that people fall into. Um, and I have not seen it adopted at scale, let's say, maybe in little pockets, but not at scale. Yeah. And I think this is, this becomes sort of the real challenge, I think, for business in general, right? Is, is the buyers are moving so much more quickly than sellers. I mean, yeah, we've got the introduction of all this new technology into sales and our sales engagement platforms, conversational intelligence, yada, yada, yada. But it's like, what we're trying to do is force this down this quote unquote funnel the way we've always conceptualized it, when instead the buyer's all over the map. Right. Yeah. You know, the implication of our methodical sales process is this is the way we think buyers buy. Where buyers actually enter that process, to your point earlier, they don't know what the hell they're doing. Right? And even if they bought a product like yours five years ago. They don't know how to buy it today. I mean, if yeah. you do something once every five years, it's it's unlikely to be documented. You've got a whole new cast of characters that have come in involved with it. The process is just going to be different. Right. And they revert to the status quo because they don't want to lose their job. They don't want to take a risk. Nobody wants to risk. But this is I saying, this is what I think really inhibits sales, sales growth and, and productivity growth among individual sellers is that, you know, again, we're not, we're not, we're not responding to the reality yeah. of the way things really are in the field. Um, and this is, it's sort of the same question. I was reading, uh, gosh, I forget who it was yesterday, uh, some sales author, and, and talking about a, really a Gartner statistic, I think from one of their studies along when the, sort of the challenger sale came out, is that you know, buyers are a challenger customer. Buyers are you know, two-thirds of the way through their buying process before they engage with sale, sellers. And then yet we've got this whole other you know, substantial portion of the sales world, sales thought leaders, so on, saying, absolutely wrong. That's not what it is at all. Um, and so you throw that into the mix. It's like, okay, well, isn't it really important that we sort of have fundamental agreement on this? <laughs> and I think Gartner had sort of answered that question with their, their buyer enablement study, yet we still have people that, that aren't adapting to it. I mean, it's, it's really the issue of how do we get people to change, right? Because I, I was reading your book, and I was thinking, 
you know, it's not that that people aren't writing some really interesting things about sales. This is that, in a relative sense, no one's reading it. Well, that's true. What what is it? I'm sure that you'll. What is it called? The Dunn Kruger effect. There's well, the Dunning Kruger effect. Is that the one where if I bought the book, I think I've read it? No. Well, you or is could, that a different one? What's that one? Well, Dunning Kruger is people overestimate the extent, oh, their, the extent their of their account. knowledge, the extent, right. extent of their expertise and their knowledge, and don't have the emotional intelligence to realize that and then and change, right? Um, but it sort of plays in that is that you know it's like we have this issue in sales is that there's all these yeah great materials, great books, great training, and so on right, being, but being produced. Doing it. Well, the people who are doing it are the people that are good already, right? That, my conviction is the people who read sales books are the people that are they're the ones uh, who don't need them. Well, it's not they don't need well, it. Well, they don't need them, but but they're they're learners. They're like they're learners, learners, right? Right. So like you and I are. They're lifelong learners. Any little bit of tidbit they can pick up to help them, and so on. They're always a constant quest. So how do we, how do we reach that that group that aren't learners? And I interested in your your response to that because I. I think it's a culture issue within companies that's really the, the driver on it, but I'm interested in your take. Okay. So this is going to be a very different answer that you've heard before. You make it fun. Truly. I think we are so serious with ourselves. We take ourselves so seriously. And what I find is when, when we do an event, we, I talk um, in, in one of our talks, we do a three-day course called It's Showtime. Mm-hmm. And it's all about the four pillars of an effective training and coaching program. And the premise, Andy, is is that, you know, there's all this talk about coaching. I know you make a great distinction. I heard on one of your podcasts between education and training. Mm -hmm. So you can make a distinction however you want. But what we call it in the four pillars is you've got to have education, which is lifelong learning. Right. Okay. That's the the ongoing education. I call it um, the growth equation. Right. Leads to a growth mindset. But the second pillar is key, and we forget it, and it's entertainment. Is it fun? Look, we don't learn unless we're in the neocortex part of our brain. And we know this. We have the brain research on it, but we don't implement it. So, And when I say it's got to be entertaining, I don't mean like, la, 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 there's banjos, and um, although there could be, (laughs) and gamification, those are great. But I mean, is the sales enablement function, is the training are you connecting with your students, with your participants as a trainer, as a leader? Um, are you creating an emotional connection? Is it creative? Are you coming at them from different angles through storytelling, through games, through art? Because then when we're in this peak emotional state, we learn better. So at number two is entertainment. Number three is facilitation. People don't believe it when we say it. They believe it when they do it. Mm-hmm. And then the final pillar, and you need all four for a successful training and coaching program is that coaching pillar is the ongoing coaching like you do at the sales house. Because as you know, you can tell somebody how to do something all you want, but the devil's in the details. It's the nuances, Mm -hmm. right? It's all of a sudden somebody says, oh yeah, I did what you told me to do. And then you sort of role play it out on your show and you're like, yeah, I didn't say to do that, (laughs) you know, and you did that. And, And there's nuances that you wouldn't even think to train on or to coach on. And then all of a sudden, those come out in that ongoing coaching and development. So the short answer, the, the, the long answer to your short question is, I think if we can make it more engaging and more fun, particularly with a generation of millennials and, and Gen Z, it's, they're going to be bored. They're going to go down to something else. So what about creating as part of, of the incentive package for a salesperson? some goal, metric, whatever I call it, related to learning. I, I talk about that all the time. I think it, it's, it's necessary, right, that we not only reward quota and the result, but we reward this idea of a growth mindset and we monitor it. So how would you and, do that? Any ideas? Um, in my company, we... I like to let people do what they want to do, but um, we've got a certain amount that everybody can spend for their own growth and education. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of the old inspect what you expect. Mm -hmm. And we tell this of our clients as well. And what we say is, you know, pick 
something that you want to delve into every month. And then we have them share what they learned. I mean, it's got to be, you know, have something to do with what we're doing, but you'd be surprised at what people find and what they do. And I have just found that by building this sort of culture of, you know, you've got so many, so much money to spend. It can be a podcast. It can be a video. It can be a course. Um, People, the right people crave that. And I say the right people and you have to hire Mm -hmm. for curiosity if you want a culture of learning and development. You know, don't expect people to, to do it unless that's who they are and what they're made of. And I believe that's intrinsic. You either have that, sure, you can build your curiosity, but if you want to sort of go home, watch football and eat bonbons and, you know, <laughs> get drunk every night, then, then you, you might not be the one who's going to, you know, want to keep learning why you're laughing i do well, like football and bonbons well i know but <laughs> i'm laughing because you use the example go home and watch football i say go home and watch the bachelor so um but yeah it's but i thing. like football don't get me wrong yeah well, i don't like the bachelor so <laughs> but it's just an example right of something so mindless to your point that that people do yeah i i and mindless is good don't get me wrong but i am amused i will tell you because i'm on a lot of airplanes Notice what people are doing in business class versus coach. And I'm not trying to be a snot here, but you will, I do find that the greater the position and the greater the stature and the higher up somebody is in a company, the more you will find them learning, working, researching, and the less you'll find them playing video games. Yeah, research well, shows re- actually research <laughs> shows Andy ninety two percent of the people who make <laughs> a seven figure income. <laughs> well, actually, I think I think part of the reason that you see that in business class or first class is that there's more privacy, so they can actually do meaningful. Oh, work so if, you're going to refute that? Okay. No, no, I'm not refuting it. I I just know there are times I'm on a plane. I'm on a plane a lot. It's it's like oh, I should bought a privacy screen for my Mac because this person next to me. Yeah, I don't know who that is, right? <laughs> it's like I could be working on a writing my book or something. Yeah, you know, it's or doing a report for a client, and I don't feel like having the world see it. But that's that's my completely unproven theory as to why people in business class are, or it's maybe just because they're drinking more and it's sim. You know, they feel like relaxed and ready to focus. Well, we must get the statistics on this. Yeah, I'm sure somebody somewhere has. Yeah, um, so. I was gonna. We're, we're further into it than I thought we'd be at this point. Um, we haven't really. Well, come- you can edit that last piece. Andy. Oh no, we don't edit anything. Uh, you is, don't edit? No, this is this is real world. Okay, great. Yeah, I said we'll just we're out of time. We'll have you come back, uh, but we are getting close. But I just wanted to st- go through one of the ten truths since we haven't gotten any of them yet. Um, as you say, trust begins with empathy, and so. Two, you know, trigger words there, trust and empathy. Uh, Tell us what you mean by that. This is probably the most important thing I can tell a seller or a leader. And this, and that is this. And I, I do this at my workshops all the time. I say there's two critical elements to selling. You've got to have your competency or you've got to know your product. And you have to have your empathy or you need to know the customer. And I pose a problem to the audience and I say, if you could only have one, empathy or competency, Mm -hmm. which one's more important, knowing your customer or knowing your product? And it's usually about split. Mm -hmm. Well, here's the result. And it's from Harvard Business Review. So I believe it. In their (laughs) article. It must be right. It must be true. (laughs) First connect, then lead. But but this I know to be true. This follows the, the good sense test. And what they say is empathy and competency. Mm-hmm. are the two most important components to influence. And what is sales, if not influence? Sorry two about that. Im- it's okay. <laughs> Real world, it's live. Don't yeah, hit it. That's right. We're on. It, so empathy and competency create 90% of influence. However, the order matters. And most sales reps get this wrong. So I would say if you take nothing else out of what I say in that book or said today, get this. Empathy gets you in the door. Competency, reliability, and integrity keep you there. Those are the four components of trust. But 
Most salespeople do it backwards and you've had it happen a million times. You connect with somebody on LinkedIn and immediately they're telling you about their state of the art custom solution that's going to make you zillions of dollars, but they haven't shown you, they know you, they don't, they haven't looked you up. They're just spamming you. So that's the classic example of this sort of leading with competency or um, in a, in a sales presentation, in a demo, in a conversation, Mm -hmm. it's the seller that starts out with the slide deck. Here's who we are. Here's how great we are. When the customer's like, yeah, but what do you know about me? Yeah. And, and so that's why I talk about trust begins with empathy, with caring about the customer, caring about their world, learning about their world. And if you look at any big deal you've ever gotten or any new deal, my guess is you really learned about the customer, you focused on the customer, and you're better off reciting to them what their problems are in meeting one and meeting two and in meeting three and waiting for them to say, so what's your solution? Mm -hmm. I always say, if we can exactly pinpoint what their problems and concerns are and the outcomes they desire are of all the stakeholders, if we can diagnose a problem, Mm -hmm. we're given the right to solve it. Mm -hmm. That begins with empathy or knowing your customer. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, I mean, because in one hand you're talking about understanding. I mean, this is a point that I sort of drill down on: is is empathy and understanding are a little different, though, right? Well, if you look at the traditional, um, you know, meaning of empathy, if you were to look it up in the dictionary, it's the ability to put yourself in someone else's shoes. So that's sort of the baseline, right? I am willing to see this from my customer's perspective instead of, oh, I want to tell them how great I am. Because we default into competency because we're insecure. Usually it's the person that goes to the party and starts boasting instead of finding out about the other person. Yeah, and I'm sort of talking about a different point. Yeah, I think one of the things we do with, let's say, like personas, where we get our marketing team or sales enablement team, you know, develop personas for people we're supposed to sell to. And somebody reads and says, Oh, I understand, right? I mean, I, I, I get how they're feeling about that. And I guess I'm sort of from like, if you've read Paul Bloom's book on the death of empathy, but, you know, it differentiates between emotional empathy and cognitive empathy. And emotional empathy is sort of the traditional, yeah, I, I can feel what you're feeling. Whereas sort of the how, as opposed to, I think it's really more important for sellers to say, I understand why you feel the way you do, which is really what you were discussing is I understand now why you, through the questions asked, why you feel the way you do. Because then that gives me more information to take, take action about. Yeah, yeah, I, I see what you're saying. So if I hear you right, you're saying that um, the, 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 really the cognitive and the emotional empathy, the emotional empathy, you actually feel inside yourself. You, yeah. There's a physical change. It's it's the monkey neurons. Right? Yeah, you're you're, I, you're feeling what feel you're feeling you. what they. Yeah, I feel what you right. Which, I feel you. Right. Whereas the cognitive empathy is, I understand why you feel that way, and thus, I'm in a better position to say, here's a solution that will work for you. And I truly believe if you can have both the cognitive <laughs> and the emotional <laughs> empathy, <laughs> that's gold. Yeah, no, I agree. I think I think you need to have you have can't have one without the other. I think uh, if you really want to be effective in in understanding and really saying, okay, what is the best path forward for the customer at this point in time? Absolutely. Yeah, it requires a little bit of being dispassionate as well as you know feeling empathy. But too often, I think in, our, in sales, what we see is the empathy sort of slips into sympathy. And right. yeah, sellers don't want your sympathy. They, they want your understanding. Right. Like, let me do this empathy step really quick so I can get to my discovery. Yeah. Oh, I'm so sorry. This is hard for you. No, no. It's, uh, <laughs> it's like, I, 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 want, I want to understand why this is hard for you. Absolutely. Yeah. Cool. All right, Sherry. Unfortunately, we're running out of time. We are definitely going to have you back because we <laughs> didn't touch the surface of what I had planned to talk about today. But we had a great conversation nonetheless. So, um Tell people how they can learn more about what you do and get in touch with you. You know, I'm very active on LinkedIn and I post a video every Sunday night. uh, Absolutely free of charge. So connect with me on LinkedIn and you can visit my website, sherry at sherrylevitin.com. And my book, Heart and Cell, is on Amazon in four languages. I have no idea what it says in Chinese. Um, And also the audio book was just released last week. Oh, excellent. Good. 
So, hey, really appreciate you coming on. Recommend people read, pick up and read your book. And we'll look forward to having you back. And we're recording this right before Thanksgiving. So have a happy Thanksgiving, you and your family. Happy Thanksgiving, Andy. All right. Talk to you soon. Bye. Okay, friends, that was Accelerate for the week. First of all, as always, I want to thank you for joining me. And I want to thank my guest and my friend, Sherry Levinson, for taking the time to join us as well. So uh, make sure to join me again next week as my guest will be Howard Brown. Howard is the founder and CEO of Ring DNA. And our primary topic will be how sellers can become better conversationalists. I have to admit, I, I love this term, conversationalists, because I think it really speaks to the essential core sales skills that is underdeveloped in most sellers. So Howard and I are going to dive into how to become a better conversationalist and how to use analytics to coach and improve. And I've just I've created a new word here, invented a new word, conversationalizing. So anyway, <laughs> I'm entitled to create a new word. So anyway, you'll make sure you check that out next week and be sure to join Howard and me then. So before you go, don't forget to visit andypaul.com and get your copy of my sales growth planner for 2020. I know that most of you have not written down your sales plan for this year. I mean, it's not enough just to think it. You've got to actually write it down. And in this sales growth planner, I walk you through a step-by-step process to create an incredibly effective sales plan to help you hit your targets this year, 2020. And you'll use, once you do that, you'll use it every year after this. And this is the same plan, same plan format that I, I use throughout my career. So to get more information, visit andypaul.com forward slash planner to get your copy. We've got a limited supply, so make sure you check that out today. That is andypaul.com forward slash planner. So thanks again for joining me. Until next week, I'm your host, Andy Paul. Good selling, everyone.